that sound coming through okay? Yeah. Yep. Everything's good. Awesome. Boom. Anthony, thank you for being on the podcast. How's your day going so far? It's going well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. So I got to start out with what is your favorite superhero? <laughs> My favorite superhero? You know, I, I've always liked the Hulk uh, just because of the dual nature of his character. Just the, yeah. the super strength, but he's also a human. And yeah. so there's that dynamic I think is really interesting. That's awesome. He's also a complete genius. Like one of the right. people. <laughs> super smart. So that helps too. I'm pretty sure he can destroy worlds. Um, I didn't read that much of the comics, but it's like they try to like kill the Hulk and he just like literally just destroys a whole world. I feel like he does not get that kind of rap in the new movies where no. he, he's, he's, he's nerfed. He got nerfed. Yeah, but there's like so many characters like that nowadays because you think about like the new Avengers and like Thanos, spoiler, it just like murders everyone. <laughs> yeah. And he does it so easily. And, like, no one can do anything. The only person is Captain America who, like, holds the glove for a minute. And I was like, mm-hmm. that's awesome. But, so, okay, so we're moving from the Hulk, the dichotomy, the the tool dualistic, being a human, being <laughs> uh, insanely strong, amazing at what you're doing. Where did filming, minimalism, and everything just come into play in your life? And now, I mean, with Break the Twitch, uh, you're almost at 50,000 subscribers, but even past that, like the content is amazing and the, the, what is inside of it is really valuable to people. So where did that start? Thanks so much for saying that. You know, it started out of my own exploration of what minimalism was. We attended a conference and when I say we, I mean my wife, Amy and I, we attended a conference around the concept of simple living and it was something we went to just by happenstance. And we learned all this stuff about these people that were living in tiny homes, were doing things like um, minimizing their homes and, and really digging into what it meant to live intentionally. And it was through that awakening of sorts to, that, we, that we really learned that that's something we wanted to pursue further because there were certain things in my life that I knew were not happening in the way that I had always wanted them to. So that's when I started decluttering. That's when we started decluttering our home, looking at different aspects of our lives and figuring out how we wanted things to change. It was from there that I started sharing what we were going through. So the steps of the process around decluttering, started writing about it. And eventually I realized that I, I really like video a lot more than writing and started posting some videos to the YouTube channel. And over the following years, that medium grew much faster than my writing did. So I kind of started focusing on that instead. Awesome. Yeah, I know you had one uh, experiment where you printed out all of your four years of Amazon purchases. Yes, that's sort of the sort of what triggered a lot of this stuff. Awesome. And that is Listen, folks, if you never like actually comb through what uh, you buy on Amazon, which is too much because that's just like quite literally how Amazon works. It's how the algorithm works. It knows you better than you know yourself. It's the default to spend too much on Amazon. Yeah, it literally is. I mean, it's the same with I was with a friend yesterday and she's like, I don't even know why I did it. I I mentioned uh, directly after this, but she pulls out her phone and she uh, she looks at Instagram. She's like, I was just looking at the time. I have no idea why I looked at Instagram. And I'm like, oh, tomorrow I'm actually having Anthony from Break the Twitch on. And like, literally, that's what he talks about is getting rid of that Twitch. <laughs> yes. Focusing on trying to mitigate it, at least. Break the Twitch might be an aggressive title because I don't know that we ever break it. it it's not mm-hmm. something that can be broken. I think it's a part of human psychology at this point that that we're going to be susceptible to these things, but it really is about bending the rules and and trying to set up an environment that allows you to break the twitch as much as possible. Awesome. And that's actually a perfect segue into, I wanted to move into the mindset behind breaking the twitch and just understanding one, how addictive these things around us are, not just phones, but like continually being a consumer. And I love that you put out that video where you talked about the media literally labels people as consumers and that's yeah, just, just regular call us that to our faces just straight up. 
So I want to just dive into the mindset behind uh, breaking the Twitch and how this is more of an all-encompassing thing versus just, hey, don't look at your phone as much. Yes, there, there's a lot of different elements of breaking the Twitch. The mindset maybe that, that goes over every aspect of this is simply being present and making choices that align with your values. That's, that's it. That's really as simple as it can be. It, awesome. it might be something as simple as not checking your phone as much or not spending quite as much on those small purchases that you don't actually need or even want really. It's a lot of those things are the things that you get and then they go in a closet somewhere quickly to move on to the next thing. So it's the idea of choosing to live intentionally. And of course, no one is perfect. I'm not perfect by any means. And this is a daily practice of figuring out what things are going to bring you joy, help you bring others joy, and help you serve in the best way possible on a day-to-day basis. And when I say serve, I just mean, how do we show up for other people? How do we do work that matters to us? How do we really, really dig in and, and make something out of, out of this life, you know? Yeah, hundred percent. And that's, and I love that uh, minimalism is a route to do that. But you you talk about also productivity habits and uh, just kind of the mindset behind it. But I did want to move into when you're referring to habits, uh, creativity, um, getting those types of actions throughout your day. How do you structure habits for creativity, for the mindset, for um, just a simple, happy life. Yeah. Well, there's a general concept around building a habit, especially when it comes to creativity. And I want to be very clear when, when I speak about creativity, mm-hmm. I don't necessarily just mean that we're finger painting or we're doing like what we associate as cre- oh, creative. You're, you know, <laughs> wow, you yeah. dress so creatively, <laughs> not just that I'm talking about showing up in a way where we are creating instead of just consuming. We are living as uh, Elizabeth Gilbert puts it this way, which I think is really great. She says living more based on curiosity than fear. Yes. And so that's what I mean when I say creativity. So when it comes to the habit of creativity, the biggest part of it is showing up on a regular basis for it. Now, that's going to look a lot of different ways, but one of the ways is if you want to create writing, you're not going to come up with great stuff at any one day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not going to be great every day, but you have to have a writing habit in place so that if the wind happens to be strong that day, your sales will be ready and you can go with it. Because if you don't put up the sales, it could be really windy, but you're not going to go anywhere. So, so it's, it's this idea that if we want to be creative, I think there are some people out there that can just kind of sit down on a whim and blast out some yeah. amazing piece of work, but that's not me. And uh, I admire anyone that, that can. But we do need to show up for it so that when the, when the, when this, like I said, using the analogy, like when the wind is there, we can catch it, we can go with it and ride it out until the next one. Totally. Yeah. And so that's, that's actually, that's awesome because when it comes to uh, creativity, and I know um, the War of Art, he talks a lot about showing up and, then one day the idea cloud or whatever shows up as well. And it starts to play into uh, everything that you're doing. Cause you get rewarded for showing up. Um, and in the book, uh, I think it's where good ideas come from. He also talks about like you, you think about thoughts over and over again and we don't realize it. Like it's just a thought that pops up like one day and it goes, goes, and then you have that amazing breakthrough idea. That's literally you show up or you keep thinking about that thing. And eventually it hits that. Yeah. And a lot of the time that breakthrough idea isn't going to be while you're trying to get it. It's, <laughs> it's you're, you're stuffing the, the coffers with, with all the work and the processing. And then it's when you're out 
sitting somewhere on a bench or surfing or doing anything else where your brain has time to subconsciously process yeah. that those things tend to come. I've heard time after time stories of people that work for six months on an idea, get nothing, and then all of a sudden they'll just stop and it just comes right up. Totally. So then where did video come into play for you? Because that's now such an amazing medium and um, you're, you produce some very high quality films. I appreciate that. I, I feel as though it's a constant work in progress and mm -hmm. I'm constantly learning because in every sense, I'm, I'm really a self-taught uh, video person. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the, the things that I create have been from starting out and creating and obviously like anyone I've had some mentors and I've had some people that have helped guide me or help include me in things which is essential so there's no real self-taught fully maybe but I didn't go to school for it is what I'll say and how it started is I actually made a little video at the job I had so the last full-time job that I had was at a bike share system here in Minneapolis mm -hmm. and I made a little tutorial video for that using the 60D, the, the DSLR that we had at the, at the yeah. shop and, and we used that and, and I cut a video just on how to use the system and it was a ton of fun and that pushed me over the edge of saying, okay, what if I do this eventually for Break the Twitch? It was almost a moment of frustration, a moment of I just don't feel like I can communicate the energy, the, the intention, the, the emotion behind what I'm trying to say here properly through writing. It's just mm -hmm. not happening. And after writing a lot over the last two years, I, I, I did a, been doing a writing challenge where I write every single day nice. and I actually stopped doing that a few months ago. I stopped because it wasn't getting... I wasn't pushing myself to improve mm. and all I wanted to do was shoot videos. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I kind of let go of that and I still think that's fine. Cause I gave it a good, I gave it a good year and a half oh. of writing every day, writing 500 words a day or so where I don't think I'm letting it go too easy to, if that's my point. Yeah. I tried to, tried to go for it and I realized that, man, I, people are responding better to this and I feel like I can actually get across the impact of what I'm trying to say where some people can do it eloquently in writing. I, I don't feel like I can't, so I'm, I'm going to wear what feels stronger for me. Totally. And again, that's practicing getting rid of things that not necessarily that writing is unnecessary, but for what you're doing right now and for what was gra you were gravitating towards, it is a similar uh, uh, situation where now you're like, hey, maybe the writing is actually taking away from the time that I could be using to film, to edit, to. I, trust me, I know that it uh, takes a lot of time to film, edit, make sure things are set up properly, and then go redo it when they aren't. Correct. <laughs> That's Nothing's worse uh, when it comes to creating this kind of stuff than feeling like you've filmed a great thing and then you notice something in it and you're like, oh man, that's terrible. That's terrible. But yeah, the, the, the creative process around video is one that you sort of have to just let go of what you want to have happen sometimes mm -hmm. and, and then just create it. And that's really what I did. When I put up that first YouTube video a couple of years ago now, it, it was just a single shot. It was like seven minutes long with really no edits. I don't think there was a weird light bouncing in <laughs> my glasses for the whole thing. That was pretty distracting. But to this day, people are like, well, you had a message. You had something to say yeah. and, and they still like that video. So it, it really is just about lowering the expectation, putting stuff out there and seeing how it goes and, and just creating to create. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is one of the hardest things for anybody starting or anybody currently actually putting things out is that dualistic nature which between, hey, I really want this to be perfect. And like the message is so strong, you know, people will get it, but you're like, ah, oh, I just, mm, something is off with this. Yep. And, <laughs> and, and just having to find the balance. To me, this always comes back to balance. Finding the balance between, am I pushing myself hard enough to create the best thing that I can make right now? Mm -hmm. And 
is this at the point where it's good enough that this is going to do what it needs to do? And is it not now overproduced and stiff feeling because I've worried too much about the filming instead of just being in the moment and getting a, an authentic message across? That's the, it's the really tricky thing, especially in the current environment of yes. global creation. It's, I, I was just reflecting on this the other day where decades ago when I was growing up, you had a few friends, you had some friends in school, maybe some friends in the neighborhood and then your parents, maybe a brother and a sister. And when you made something, you would want to impress about six people, right? You, <laughs> you would make something, maybe it was like a little video with your friends or on a VHS tape. And then you'd show your parents and you would, that is the circle of people that you would care about. And those are the people that would in, influence what you did next. If they said, that was great. Hey, you can try to improve it in this way. Try this or, or maybe not even that. Just say, keep going. This is awesome. And it was those six people. And now we are on a, in, 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 um, I'm sorry. And then it was those friends that were yep. also creating those things that were also into making videos that you'd be in essence competing with. Yep. And I don't mean competing negatively. I just mean that is your idea of what the skill level is. So it gives you this room to mm -hmm. create. You're, you're just kind of competing with the guy, the, the kid next door. And now we have access to creators all around the world and and we're seeing that constantly. And if you think about the, the scope for a 10 or an 11 year old now that oh my has a cell phone camera and starts uploading on YouTube, if they look at what they're making and then they look at Casey Neistat or even yeah. I'll say like Matt Diavella, who's creating, yep. he's been a filmmaker for 15 years and now he's making YouTube videos. It's like, man, that's just, it's amazing. And it's, it's going to influence, I think, younger people's willingness to just create stuff without feeling like they're competing on a global stage. Does that make sense? Yeah, a hundred percent. And I want to stress the point that you're essentially supposed to be just doing the best that you can with what you have at this point in time, because that is exactly uh, when I started, I was like looking at like Peter McKinnon and like all these people. And I was like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. I was like, okay, so fuck, I already need uh, four more grand to buy a newer camera. And then yep. I need to get all these lighting kits and then I need to make sure I have LUT set up. And I'm like trying to do all of this stuff immediately. And then I was like, okay, rewind. What if I just reframe all that? I just do quick cuts and I just focus on the message for right now. Boom. Yep. Amen. It it's uh it's, yeah, especially anybody coming into it, anybody who just even thinks about it and then they go on and they're like, How can I do what Casey's doing? And like trying to vlog like that, like his storytelling is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, but it's also not something I would say most people want in their life. Most people don't want to do what these guys are doing, yet they're the models for who they think they should be. Yeah. I would argue that filmmakers, directors were in a lot of ways, obviously respected. They made a lot of money coming out of Hollywood, that kind of stuff. But Casey and Peter McKinnon and, and all these guys, Matty, uh, I can't even pronounce his last name, probably how Poj. Uh, yep. <laughs> um, these guys, they're changing, they're changing the landscape into where a, a director and inspiring an entire generation of kids to be filmmakers because they're seeing these guys as like really, oh man, they're hot shots. They're so cool and they're creating this stuff. And, and it's, uh, it's such a crazy shift around what it means to be a filmmaker, what it means to be a director. I mean, it, it's, you know, you've got, again, going back to Matt, like you've got a guy that yep. has sold do a documentary or two to Netflix. And now he's on a platform that any 11 year old could upload, you know, literally like my, my nephew is uploading little videos and stuff. And, and it's just crazy. It's awesome that, yeah. that this is being democratized and it's, uh, I think intimidating for a lot of people. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I hope Matt does get the rock on his podcast. That would be phenomenal. I hope so too. I know it's so important to him and, and I think it'd be so great to, to see that happen. Yeah. 
going back to what you were saying where you were competing with only your friends um and just going back to that that mindset of when you were a kid i want to know when you were a kid because i know this is with the way that it is with a lot of creators were you the kid who could come up with a story on the spot or like would go on to these fantastical thoughts and start thinking about all these like random situations i know that's me i would act everything out or i'd try to like I would go on tangents and people would be like, dude, I stopped listening like 10 minutes ago. And I'm like, (laughs) yeah, you know, in a lot of ways, my creativity showed up differently as a kid. I think than that specific paradigm that, that you mentioned, I always just enjoyed making things out of something. So, you know, those, the styrofoam cartons that meet, comes on it's like the the thing that has the plastic wrap around it but the the base of the the styrofoam that thin stuff for whatever reason we would just have egg carton old egg cartons and and those obviously washed styrofoam things and i remember that one of the ways i entertained myself as a kid was cutting those up and in gluing them together or taping them together and creating things out of that styrofoam uh just taking stuff and turning it into something new or different. I always enjoyed that sort of thing. I remember writing a picture book of some type when I was younger and and just really enjoying things and even creating a game that had all these different types of weapons. And it was, it was something I was really into. So yeah, there definitely were elements of people thought I might have been a more creative person than not as a as a young kid awesome and did that bring you into what did you go to college did you study anything I did for a while uh yeah, yeah. so when I went in it's it's a funny journey actually it's not funny at all but it's it's uh it's just a bit odd I went in to college I applied as a graphic design major mm. I did a bunch of gen eds and and then went into some music because I play piano and 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 wanted to do some of that direction then kind of realized i didn't want to probably play music for a career and then i left eastern michigan where i was after two years and i went to a audio engineering program a one-year thing at another college locally did that for a year and then i when i was about 20 uh i had a late birthday so when i was 20 21 i went to i started working full-time at an audio company and okay. ever since then it's just been the path of discovering myself through different jobs and different interests and things some entrepreneurial ventures that did not work well uh one or two that did and then now where i am which is you know running a video production company and doing youtube and blogging and stuff awesome yeah i'm actually i went to michigan state oh cool yeah i grew up in ann arbor oh really yeah i'm a uh, west bloomfield area Oh, there you go. So we're, yeah, we're the Michiganders here. Nice. Yep. Yep. Um, No, I had a similar story, actually. I went to Michigan State uh, junior, I was going for neuroscience, dropped out and uh, went to join a startup company and learn everything about marketing. So that was my uh, introduction into that realm. That's quite a shift. Neuroscience. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. uh, The thing is, and this is what I've always told people is, if you're trying to understand anything like neuroscience, for instance, uh, the reason that you're doing it is because you want to understand yourself and other people and marketing and all of that and video and understanding, Hey, if I do it from this angle, like, uh, I know Spike Lee loves shooting up ang- or yeah, shooting from above when he's making someone look smaller and shooting from below when he's trying to make them authority. Um, it all plays into just the human psyche. I mean, we're all just, things trying to figure out what we are. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And especially when maybe the traditional path of education or different things like that don't work so well for you and don't necessarily help you figure that out. That's when a lot of people turn towards either entrepreneurship or different sorts of consulting or different things that, that allow them to in a way create their own path or at this point, follow a path that's, that's different. Yeah. And that's such an amazing thing about our time is that you can follow a different path. You don't have to go the traditional route. Um, and the the shitty thing is, uh, I know a lot of professors, a lot of school teachers are there because it's easy. 
and they did it all because it was easy and then they got tenured and then blah, blah, blah. And that all plays into you not feeling as worthy when you're learning at school. Right. Uh, there's definitely a personality type and a, definitely a type of intelligence where a predictable model of complete the class, get the credit, get the degree, get the next degree, get the postdoc, get the right. Just having that perfect expectation. I know where I'm going to be in this many years and I can figure out the system and play it just fine. There's a, there's a personality that works really well for that. And as a, I can't remember his name, Sir Ken uh, Robin, Robinson, is it that talks about the, the entire educational system is set up mm. to create professors. <laughs> that yeah. is the ideal path outcome of the, of the, the education system as it is, <laughs> which is interesting. And you know, it's uh, what's funny is I always wanted to be a teacher. I always thought I really? might be a high school teacher or a music teacher and instead, I didn't go that route of getting the education to be a teacher, but instead learning through my own mediums and then sort of teaching, I guess, yeah. on YouTube or teaching through the blog and doing it that way instead, which didn't click until I was a year or two into this. And someone was like, hey, you're kind of, are you a teacher? Because this is, sounds like you're doing that. And so I don't know, it's, it's, uh, it's a good way to explore it. Totally. And yeah, this is, uh, I think the best teachers are the ones who learned themselves or have truly interpreted the information enough to the point of which they can distill that information. Mm -hmm. Right. If you can explain it simply, then you know it pretty well, probably. Exactly. So I do want to ask you, what is your uh, a higher leverage skill that comes to mind that you've been using throughout this time going from Eastern, being a kid, playing with the milk cartons. And essentially what a higher leverage skill is, is something that you learn in one field or you learn somewhere that can apply to many other areas. So learning to learn, that's a high leverage skill because then you can learn anything better. Um, learning how to breathe better because then your workouts are better. You can meditate better. You can have sex better, like all these different things. Mm -hmm. And pattern recognition, it's another one. If you can see the patterns and things, then you can understand similarities and extrapolate and so on. Are there any higher leverage skills that you've used throughout your uh, career to be where you are today? It, definitely. And the one that immediately comes to mind is my willingness to start without knowing the full picture. My, my willingness to just go in, buy the camera, and run with it, and, and maybe make some really bad videos or take some really bad pictures, but uh, I've always just gone neck deep into my interests, into the different things that I want to explore, and learning how to learn on the fly through doing and being willing to fail initially has probably been my greatest strength because it's led me into so many different things that have, have enriched my life and gone well and, and some gone poorly, but there's always something to learn and grow from that process. So yeah, definitely that one. That is awesome. And that is literally relating back to the doing the best with what you have at this time and then just being better than who you were during that time, because now you have a little bit more you can use. Exactly. It's just a building process and then collecting the, have, are you familiar with the term multi-potentialite? Uh, no, I'm not, but now I'm going to obsess over it. <laughs> there you go. It's uh, it's someone that's multi-passionate, someone who has lots of different interests and the people that tend to be in that zone, which is where I tend to exist. They want to have lots of different interests and in things, and they tend to be able to tie lessons from different areas back into the new things they're doing. So yes. connecting the ideas to make new ideas or connecting principles or, or different lessons and applying it to whatever they're doing next. And, and that I think embodies a lot of how I got here, or how I ended up doing this stuff. So I'm so happy that you just gave me that because I always would try, I would make up words to be honest, but try to figure out what the, what that term would be because my favorite thing, and this is why I was uh, a little upset with the school system, is when science, math, and history would all relate to one another, and you would see that in history, you're learning about the guys who created the math theorem, which was then learned or used to 
help in chemistry in some sort of way. And you would remember all of it because it was all being presented to you at a similar time around a similar subject. So multi-potentialite. Mm-hmm. Yep. Awesome. There's an entire community for multi-potentialites called the Putty Tribe. Emily Wapnick did a fantastic TED Talk on what it's like to be a person with multiple interests, to be a multi-passionate person. And the, the essence, the essential outcome is that the world needs both. We need specialists and we need people that cross genres, that, that explore different areas that can start, like I said, combining those ideas and, and bringing things together. Awesome. Well, I will be joining the Putty Tribe uh, probably directly <laughs> after this because <laughs> that is, uh, I'm so ecstatic that I know that that is now an actual thing. Mm-hmm. Did you, um, so throughout the years since, uh, since college, have you had lots of different jobs or different things that you've, you've explored or have you been pretty... Oh yeah. Um, not job wise necessarily. I mean, working for a startup, you take, you undertake a lot, but yes. when it comes to research, uh, yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, I'm someone who has quite literally four books next to my, uh, bed that I'm cycling through every day. So I read about a chapter from each of them and then relate them in a commonplace book. And oh, then my nice. whole, uh, closet is just filled to the brim with books. There you go. Uh, Jane, uh, is it James Altucher? He says yep. that, that's the strategy. You, you yeah. like read a chapter from each and then start bouncing the ideas. So you, you're yes. clearly familiar. Yeah. Yeah. I started that uh, freshman year of college when I read Choose Yourself. And then I was like, this is the coolest thing. But sometimes yeah. I'll have like four audiobooks too. And then I'm like, I don't even know what my life has just succumbed to. Where am I right now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Choose Yourself. Fantastic book. Highly recommended. I just, uh, I just read it as well probably eight months ago. Awesome. So I was slower to that than, than you were. I wish I'd read it earlier. It's uh, when, you, when you get good at that strategy, um, I have the best time when I'm reading four books that don't talk about, they're not focused on the same thing because they always end up focusing on the same thing. And I think it's the most hilarious but best thing ever. Everything's connected. That's just because we're all doing the same stuff. It's, it's like... I just had this conversation with with um, Lucia, who who is working in wellness and food and all these things, and we're talking. And by the end of the interview, I'm just sitting there like, "We're you're doing it through food, but we're we're all talking about the same stuff here: how how to love ourselves, how to yep. how to. Uh, oops, sorry. Oh, you're good. <laughs> we're all talking about the same stuff here: how to love ourselves, how to live a good life, and be be the best we can and understand ourselves and others. And it's like some people talk about doing that through food. Others yep. do it through minimalism, through habits, creativity. It's, we're all talking about the same stuff. That's why. Totally. And that's why I, uh, being um, part of the putty tribe now, sorry, I'm already uh, saying that I'm part of it, but um, <laughs> being in that thought paradigm, that's why I'm always like, when someone is like, this is the one way or this is the one thing, I'm always like, dude, it cannot be. It never will be. Yeah. There's just so many routes. There's so many routes and advice. It's the nature of advice, right? So uh, <laughs> you can tell someone that you really need to just let go and just be present. Don't overbook yourself. Just let go. And then for another person, and that's someone who's overscheduled, who's putting pressure on themselves, trying to control everything. But if you give that advice to someone that is like not taking action to make things happen in their life, that's horrible advice. Totally. Because they're already just letting, letting go. Um, and so that is just the nature of advice and people and humans doing things. <laughs> totally. So, okay. So this is a perfect segue. I need to ask what at this point in time, are you currently questioning? And so it can be religion, religion, politics, life, how doorknobs work. Doesn't matter what it is, but it quite literally just needs to be something that common consensus is always like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like, I just don't think it works that way. <laughs> well, very in earnest, what I'm questioning is if the internet entrepreneur life and the freelancer life is actually all that great. <laughs> totally. Uh, everyone seems to be really, I think very, everyone seems to think very highly of it and 
I used to think very highly of it like, oh, this is the best. You work from anywhere, you work from home, you can set your hours, you can just work from all over the world. I thought YouTubers just had it easy. Like all you have to do is just make videos and upload them for a living, come on. And now that I've been doing it for a couple of years, I, I miss having the structure of a job. I miss having elements of the regularity of things, a, a team of people that I'm working with regularly. There's a lot of things that I'm thinking back and going like, man, it's uh, there's no just thing that is yes. great, especially when you're in the building phase and you're still month to month making it all work and making it all come together. It's uh, It's not ideal. I can let you know in a year or two, uh, <laughs> once thing, you know, if, uh, that changes, but right now I'm questioning the perception of this stuff being any better than having a normal job. Totally. It's uh, you can set your hours, but, uh, it's all the hours of the day. You can set your hours, but you can set your hours, which yeah. means, right. Like it's, I, this into everything. I have a similar, uh, perception. I, I do love freedom and i'm someone who's like uh authority not in the sense of like rebelling but uh questioning uh their validity of what they're saying typically Mm -hmm. so i know that i need something like this but when it comes down to it like i mean you are working all the time and it isn't anything it's not like the nine to five to me is uh you're in an office building with horrible lighting and it's really unhealthy and all these things. I'm like, if you can correct all that, like there's some places that you probably would love to work rather than being the solopreneur going at it by himself, working 14 hours a day. Mm -hmm. I'm lucky that, that I do work with my wife, Amy. So we work together on this stuff, but I'm an extrovert and I, I need that social interaction, that team feeling of all working on this thing together and we're all doing different things and get to talk about it. And there's a huge element of that that I miss. And, and that becomes something that's no longer a default. It doesn't just happen. I have to set coffees and I have to take the initiative to make sure that I'm working on other things that, that are with other people from time to time. And we both have to sort of create that for ourselves now instead of it being a default. There, so there are just a lot of benefits, especially if you're working with people you like. It's, it's pretty huge. Yeah. Have you tried working at any like WeWorks or anything like that or it just doesn't vibe? I did. I did. There's a, there's one here in Minneapolis called Fueled Collective. We have WeWork now and and there's all a bunch of different ones. I used to work out of Fueled Collective. It used to be called Coco, but it was great. And, but the funny thing is, is I always wanted to be productive in those days. So I'd go once a week and I'd sit down and put on my headphones and I'd end up doing a ton of writing and being very productive and talking to like one person. Mm -hmm. So it it became this thing (laughs) where I had to structure it. It wasn't accomplishing what I needed it to accomplish. And then I wasn't able to make it as much anymore. And so it just, I ended up canceling it. So I did try it. I think under the right circumstance, it could work really well. Yeah. It's something like uh, I talked to David Burke and he, he talks all about network science, but his whole thing is when you go to a party, like, or a, meet up you just talk to the people you know right <laughs> right and and especially here in minnesota or in the midwest i think in general maybe more so in minnesota people tend to be a little clickier too and and it's uh, you really have to take initiative and especially i'll say getting older getting into my 30s now it's like people tend to have their groove and they sort of just stay in that groove and you have to work extra hard to make the meetups happen to make the connections happen especially when you're not in an office where you'd be naturally meeting new people coming in and out. Totally. So moving to the next topic, are you currently obsessed with anything? (laughs) Uh, Everything in some moment or another. Right now, the biggest thing is launching this podcast. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm doing it with a two camera setup and it's been just such a process of figuring out how to do this well in a nine foot by 10 foot office and getting the sound to lock in and getting really everything looking and feeling like I want it to feel. So that's been sort of the, the, I would say obsession of late. I, I don't tend to, the the word obsession is like, I I don't know. I don't tend to go when I think of it, I think of deep dive, like, (laughs) 
rabbit hole. And I don't tend to be there. I keep things pretty, pretty surface level in terms of when I can get the general understanding of something that's, I'm pretty comfortable with that. But that's been the big thing recently. It's just figuring out how to edit this, how to make it my own and, and not just have it be something that looks like other stuff out there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then getting great audio out of some SM7Bs and uh, the, the audio chain that I have going on. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, no, the audio sounded phenomenal on uh, the first one that I watched recently. I was like, oh my God, soon. <laughs> good, good. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And I'll link that video um, that you recently posted about podcasting, setting up your podcast, things to keep in mind. Yeah, we've got one more coming tomorrow. Uh, well, time frame isn't yeah. going to matter. I've got... I've got one more coming soon here that we'll have the second part talking about specifically the equipment and the other stuff that, that will highlight all of that stuff too. Awesome. Well, I'll get both of those up. Otherwise, where can people find you, Anthony? The best place is probably just break the twitch.com. And that's obviously on, on YouTube as well. Break the Twitch, break the Twitch, break the Twitch over all the social media networks and all that good stuff. So yeah, just break the twitch.com and that's the hub of where you can find just about everything. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Really appreciate you having me, Austin. Thank you. Of course.